Welcome to the November 2018 Chess Journal video highlight. I'm Yonatan Greenstein, Assistant Web and Multimedia Editor for Chess, and I'm excited to discuss a few articles in this month's issue. They run the gamut from blood glucose targets in the intensive care unit, to infection control with reprocessing of flexible bronchoscopes, to a drug in the pipeline for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. These are just a few of the great publications this month, so be sure to also check out the full journal, either in print or online. First up is a study by Andrew Hirsch and colleagues at the University of Utah entitled Lower Glucose Target is Associated with Improved 30-Day Mortality in Cardiac and Cardiothoracic Patients. Glucose control in the intensive care unit has been a hot topic since the early 2000s with Vandenberg's New England Journal of Medicine study demonstrating mortality benefit to tight glucose control in critically ill surgical patients. In 2009, the NICE Sugar trial showed that intensive insulin therapy compared to conventional increased mortality. This was shown to be largely driven by increased incidence of moderate to severe hypoglycemia in the intensive therapy group. The authors of the current study hypothesize that improvements in insulin therapy would improve the ability to maintain glucose in a tight window without significant hypoglycemia. This was a retrospective study that included 1,809 patients from three different intensive care units and two hospitals. The population was mainly cardiovascular and cardiothoracic, with sepsis making up only 3.9% of the patients. The authors used a computerized insulin infusion protocol with two blood glucose targets, 80 to 110 milligrams per deciliter or 90 to 140 milligrams per deciliter. All patients received intravenous regular insulin using a smart pump and had a 2 to 1 or 1 to 1 patient to nurse ratio. The groups were well matched with only slight but statistically significant differences in age and Charleston comorbidity score. The tighter target was slightly older and the wider target was slightly sicker. Patients in the tight group were more likely to experience an episode of moderate hypoglycemia. Both groups had low rates of severe hypoglycemia. Blood glucose less than 60 was associated with increased mortality regardless of group. There was a statistically significant difference in unadjusted 30-day mortality between the 80 to 110 group and the 90 to 140 group, 4.3% versus 9.2%. Additionally, irrespective of treatment assignment, unadjusted 30-day mortality increased with increasing median glucose. This study was not a randomized double-blind controlled trial, and thus its conclusions are subject to confounding, and they should serve as a call to arms to restudy glucose targets in the era of computerized insulin infusion protocols. Perhaps strict control with the avoidance of hypoglycemia will bear fruit in this new era. An excellent editorial by Dr. James Crinsley from Stanford Hospital in Connecticut accompanies this important study. For everybody performing bronchoscopies or managing bronchoscopy suites, this next article by Corey Ofsted and colleagues entitled Effectiveness of Reprocessing for Flexible Bronchoscopes and Endobronchial Ultrasound Bronchoscopes is a must read. Its results are truly alarming. This was a prospective study at three hospitals in the U.S. Human subjects were not involved. Researchers obtained samples from the bronchoscopes after manual cleaning and post-high-level disinfection. Microbial culture samples were harvested from ports and distal ends of the scopes. ATP levels, hemoglobin, and protein tests were performed. Additionally, visual examinations of reprocessed scopes were performed with a microboroscope, and photographs of irregularities were taken. Alarmingly, protein was detected from 100% of bronchoscopes after manual cleaning cleaning and 100% post high level disinfection. ATP was detected in scopes post manual cleaning and post high level disinfection. The arrows in figures 1A and 1B from the article show residual debris on patient ready bronchoscopes. 55% of manually cleaned bronchoscopes had microbial growth and 58% of post high level disinfection bronchoscopes had microbial growth as well. Isolated organisms included Staphylococcus epidermidis, Stenotrophomonas multifilia, E. coli, and Shigella, amongst others. The researchers also tested new bronchoscopes that had never been cleaned, and at one of the clinical sites in the study, a bronchoscope that had no contamination detected post-manual cleaning had protein detected and bacterial growth after it underwent high-level disinfection, suggesting the methodology of high-level disinfection actually introduced contamination into a brand new bronchoscope. Be sure to check out the accompanying editorial by Drs. Atul Mehta and Thomas Gildea from the Cleveland Clinic. 
finally, the drug pipeline for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is primed with many drugs in early phase clinical trials. Scott Palmer and colleagues in this issue add the results of a phase two trial to the mix with their paper entitled, A Randomized Double-Blind Placebo-Controlled Phase Two Trial of BMS 986020, a lisphophosphatidic acid receptor antagonist for the treatment of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis overall has poor outcomes with a three to five year median survival and currently only two drugs, perfenidone and entetinib, which have been shown to slow decline in FVC are approved for use in the US. Lisphophosphatidic acid receptor 1, LPA1, has been shown to play a role in fibroblast recruitment, vascular leak, and endothelial barrier dysfunction. And this industry-funded phase 2 trial assessed the ability of BMS 986020, an antagonist of LPA1, to have a positive impact on the rate of change of FVC in patients with IPF compared to placebo. 143 patients were randomized from 52 sites in six countries. Patients treated with twice daily dosing of the study drug demonstrated a significantly slower rate of decline in FVC. This was not the case for once daily dosing. There were no significant differences in mean change from baseline in dyspnea, diffusing capacity, or six minute walk test. Three patients receiving the study drug developed cholecystitis that resulted in cholecystectomy and LFT abnormalities that led to early study termination. Certainly more research is needed to see if BMS 986020 can emerge as a viable drug in the armamentarium against IPF. Comparison against the two existing drugs and or in combination with them is of interest and is likely to be explored in the future. Be sure to read the full articles in the journal in print or online. This is Jonathan Greenstein, Assistant Web and Multimedia Editor for Chest. See you next time.